interest, and that will be held down at Intel. Uh, it's going to be on the second Thursday. Normally, we're on the third Thursday because of uh, moving away from Thanksgiving. Uh, also, this this event is a a joint event with uh, Silicon Valley uh, Virtual Reality, which uh, is three over here uh, are <laughs> members of. Hey, uh, Carl, uh, you want to talk about your your group and say your next meeting? Uh, yeah. So, uh, so it, for those of you who don't know, Silicon Valley Virtual Reality is we're focused on consumer virtual reality and what consumer price virtual reality opens up. So uh, we meet every month. Um, our next meeting is on the next day, November 15th, at Hacker Dojo. So it's on a Friday night at Hacker Dojo. We meet pretty much every month at Hacker Dojo. So uh, sign up. Come on down. Uh, we welcome your donations for the food, or, or if you want to sign up and become a member of our group, we're only $20 a year. And we actually have a QR code up here somewhere to, uh, <laughs> if you want to uh, sign up via you via your phone uh, and let's see oh the uh, uh, those might be interested in SIGGRAPH Asia in November um, I believe we uh, check online for that that's uh, another uh, international SIGGRAPH uh, meeting with the key research plan all right uh, so now we'll start with <laughs> near eye light field displays uh, so uh, this is going to be, uh, uh, this was presented, well, it was presented at SIGGRAPH That's and was also an emerging technologies display there. Uh, it's always interesting to see what's there, so. Uh, Douglas Lennon has been at, uh, is at NVIDIA Research right now and has been at many labs, uh, research labs, MIT, I see, uh, Lincoln Lab. <laughs> Los Alamos, uh, <laughs> this goes on. Uh, so uh, we look forward to hearing more about your talk. And uh, this is kind of an extension of uh, or, uh, what was presented at, at the VR group here uh, in more detail. <laughs> Thank well, you. Thank you. So thanks for showing up this evening and bearing with the AV. It's great to have, you know, be in the SIGGRAPH community. Uh, this really is the community I published in. You know, I've been a graduate student and a postdoc for going on more than half a decade now, and so you know, every time I could be part of SIGGRAPH, uh, it's always very exciting. And it's one of the many reasons I chose to study graphics in the first place. I went to SIGGRAPH and I saw how much fun it is, particularly emerging technology. I said, this is what I should be doing. And so I closed the book on physics and decided to start working on graphics. Probably a good choice. Physics is hard. Um, <laughs> so before coming to NVIDIA, I've been at NVIDIA for about a year. Uh, prior to that, for a couple of years, I was a postdoc at the Media Lab working with Ramesh Raskar. Some of you might know him. Um, and my passion at the time was, was working on glasses-free 3D displays, right? So remember, this was three, four years ago now when I started doing this. That, that still was when the 3D hype was still on the upward trend. It seemed like a good problem to work on. It still is, I think. It's certainly a challenging problem. But when I got to NVIDIA, I said, OK, you know, I know a lot about multi-view imaging, 3D displays, light fields. What can I do for you, right? So we sat down and we started discussing what problems might matter. And this was last summer. And you know, all of us read Engadget or TechCrunch or I'm a little older, so I still read Slashdot. I used to follow that. Um, and of course, wearables were on the horizon. This is before Google Glass, before Oculus Rift, but everyone knew they were coming. And so I decided to sit down and take the skill set I have and try to do something new in the wearable space. And this project is sort of an obvious, given my background, an obvious description. It's a light field display applied to near-eye wearable applications. And so really, uh, the first day I started NVIDIA, we pitched this at lunch. And I said, yeah, I think you could do this. You could take a 3D TV, something like a lenslet treatment of a display, shrink it down and cram it up against your face, and use the multi-view capability of that display, rather than really giving you a multi-view experience, giving you the ability to float an object far enough away that you could comfortably focus on it. Right? That's the high-level concept of why a light field might even work in near eye. But I said, look, I'll go run the equations, but I don't think it'll look very good. Right? All of us know about, how many of you have heard of the Lytro camera? Being in Silicon Valley, it's going to be near 100%. Right? So, so everyone's familiar with Lytro. Anyone who's worked on light field knows the, the, you know, the killer reason that you don't see a lot of consumer products is you give up a lot of spatial resolution. You take something, like in Lytro's case, it's an 11 megapixel sensor, 
and you give you something arguably that's around a megapixel image, right? Huge loss in spatial resolution. I said, you know, displays are not 11 megapixels yet, right? We're still at the two to four megapixel range of displays. That trade may not be viable. And so this is a rare case, although I've had a short research career, where my instinct was, was really just completely wrong, although it often is in hindsight. It, it turns out it works surprisingly well. There are many reasons this should fail. Spatial resolution should be lost. You have small lenses close to the eye, you should have diffraction, scattering, all sorts of artifacts. And so, you know, in this talk, at least in, over the next 50 minutes or so, I sort of try to give you a sense of why a near eye light field display might be beneficial and why it's viable at all. Uh, okay, so let's dive in. So again, starting last summer, I knew almost nothing more than, than popular press tells you about head-mounted displays. So I go to, go to Google and I say, okay, immersion learning from the fire hose, what is a head-mounted display and where did it come from? <laughs> Right? And this is what I found. I really should take the name off this slide. Uh, you know, not surprisingly, all of you probably know who Ivan Sutherland is. You should if you're in graphics, right? So I was pleasantly surprised to find Ivan was arguably the first to ever create a graphics-driven head-mounted display. So when you say virtual reality or augmented reality, what was the first device, first implementation? Ivan was the first, right? He was the first for pen-based computing, the first for gestural interaction, the first for real-time, all, it just goes on and on and on. So, a lot to respect, and yet another thing I can put, put uh, on the list. So, the, this is his actual prototype. Keep in mind the date, this is 1968, right? Almost half a century ago. So what did Ivan build? So, does anyone know the name of this system? So it's, it's actually a great name, it's called the Sword of Damocles. Right? There's a couple interesting things to learn. First off, project names were way cooler in the late 60s. Right? So I think we need to up our game back to you know, interesting things that possibly don't map to a domain name that you can get. So Sword of Damocles, the reason it was called that is you can see here's Ivan's system at, on top here. And because he's using late 60s technology, basically CRTs, he has to suspend the device from the ceiling with pipes and cables that can fall at any minute and kill you. Right? But if you ignore the killing you part, this is an incredible system, and there's a lot to respect. So look at the image on the right. right? What you'll notice first off the bat, this head mount, if you ignore the part at the ceiling, is roughly the size of every head mount you see now, right? If you saw you know, an Oculus Rift, this is not so bulky. Right? And in addition, the really surprising thing to me is, notice you can see Ivan's eyes. And if he was here, he can see you. This is not virtual reality. From the very beginning, the first head mount was true augmented reality. And it wasn't augmented reality like Google Glass up in the corner. It was the real deal. Smack dab in the center of your field of view, so superimposed on the real world, right? This is Ivan Sutherland, so he didn't stop there. All these cables and weights had a point. He could actually measure real-time head tracking, just like the Oculus Rift. And you could take that real-time head tracking information, and with your graphics card in the late 60s, <laughs> render a real-time wireframe composited on the world, right? So arguably, this was a superior augmented reality experience than you can have with any commercial device today. Right? So, so again, 1968. Okay. So, so that's where we started. Now we go forward half a century. Click. Click again. Right? This is, whoops, too many clicks. I forget we're on a video conference here. So here's what we got. Right? So, depending on how snarky you are, my new, usual description looking at this is we got nowhere in half a century, right? <laughs> These are still boxes, they're just no longer tied to the ceiling. But they're very stifling, they're very uncomfortable, they're very bulky. Right? So the top two rows show you, all of these devices actually are, are things that have been sold or marketed within the last decade. Right? And the top two rows are mostly professional devices. CAD, simulation and training, military, that sort of thing. And the bottom row are the first sort of attempts at bringing these concepts into the consumer space, right? So why is it that these things look like a small shoebox on your head, right? A lot has changed since the late 60s, right? We can pack a computer into anything, right? Everyone likes to say that we have supercomputers in our pockets. We do, right? So that's not the problem, right? We can render anything in real time. What hasn't changed in the last half century are the laws of physics, right? The reason these things are bulky is you're trying to do something that you really shouldn't be able to do with any common sense. You're trying to take a high resolution, beautiful display like your cell phone screen and somehow in a small form factor cram it close to your face, right? So if you haven't thought about head mounts, why is it that we can't just download an app called virtual reality and 
put our phones here, right? Obviously, the human vision, unfortunately, cannot focus because there wasn't a reason to prior to virtual reality to focusing a few centimeters in front of our face. Depending on your age, you may be able to focus, if you're lucky, maybe six centimeters, 10 centimeters, a little more. Just take your hand and look at the creases and bring it in. If you're, if you're nearsighted, you're somewhat blessed. You can take your glasses off and you may be able to focus actually on your phone. So for you, you don't need the Oculus Rift. You can just put your phone in front of your face. But for the rest of us that don't have severe myopia, we need some optics. Right? And therein lies the challenge, right? It's just physics. If you want to magnify an object close to your face, as I'll be showing you later, you simply need a large volume to do that using traditional solutions. And all of these things use traditional solutions. All right, so using light fields, this is what I've built over the last year at NVIDIA. Now, I'm not an industrial designer, and I don't pretend to be one, so look past the rough edges and the very simple design. It is a box. <coughs> but if you ignore it, the design, you can see that this is much closer to what we want. You know, if you look you know, from the front, you can forget this box at the top, because the box at the top is just holding driver electronics. So I actually ripped apart a Sony head mount to get the organic light of many panels I'll be describing. And not being an electrical engineer, I just left that driver board. But with good engineering, you can eliminate this box entirely. So the real point of this, how do you design the magnifying optics? Well, if you take it apart, it's incredibly simple. It is exactly a 3D display scaled down. So for those of you who have experience or knowledge about glasses 3 3D display, the dominant method to do that, and really the only one that looks good in my opinion, is very simple. Take a really nice, say a 4K panel, and glue a lenslet array on top. The only subtlety is you want to tilt the lens array slightly, but that's nuance. So we do exactly the same thing. We basically take a high resolution OLED panel, the best you can buy at the moment, and put a small lens loader right, it's about three millimeters thick, right? And so we go from, and I'll start passing this around, we go from a magnifier, this is the original Sony magnifier that weighs 65 grams and is four centimeters thick. <coughs> so this was around the state of the art. You might be able to get this down to two, two and a half centimeters. You could get rid of the glass, but still, if you start with something like this, you're never gonna end up with a very nice, comfortable eyeglasses-like or sunglasses-like form factor. So, by replacing this whole magnifier stack with an array of small magnifiers, we're not cheating physics, we're simply leveraging the fact that the F number of this lens, say this is an F2 system, right? So the focal length is twice the lens width. Well, if we just make the lens small, right? Then that means that the thickness can also decrease, but we have to repeat the lens so we have enough field of view to see a wide immersive experience. And so that's the lens array. This weighs 0.7 grams and gives you a similar field of view, although lower resolution. So be careful when you're passing this around, it, it may disappear on you, but this is the small uh -huh. micro lens array. <coughs> so that's the hardware. Here's what you get. So again, remember that the box on top just holds driver electronics. So if you're sympathetic, give me credit that this box could be taken away entirely. So if you believe that, I don't think there's any head mount that can give you an immersive four degree field of view or better that's this light and small, right? Essentially, you have the temples of eyeglasses, and this is your entire head mount, which is a one centimeter thick device right in front of your face, and that's it. Okay, so that's what light fields allow you to do. Here's what it'll look like. So I'll be doing a demo afterwards, but it takes some time to show everyone the demo. So not everyone will get to try the actual device. So I'm showing a video, which unfortunately doesn't play great over the stream, but you can also see this on the YouTube uh, feed of this project. But if you look at this, you can see that the coin, barely on this feed, and the screw go completely out of focus, yet you can see a sharp image, right? So it is a near-eye display. Can we talk about the material of that uh, uh, lens array? I'm happy to. So this lens array, right, so being a research scientist, this was my first project with NVIDIA. I felt it was good not to completely fail on the first one, so I didn't spend thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars on the components. Yeah. So this entire prototype I'll be describing cost $500 using off-the-shelf parts. So as a result, the lens array, that size lens array maybe costs 30 cents. Is that plastic? When it's plastic, it's, it's polycarbonate. Not acrylic. No, uh, so well, this one, uh, this one is actually acrylic. You can get both types from the supplier. You have to have a decoloration. Yes. So this one, I believe, is acrylic that I'm passing out. I used a polycarbonate one. Because the light came off Yeah. So, but again, this is just proof of concept. Oh. So, so this lens array, 
is actually intended to be a diffuser in an IR motion detector. So I, I was entirely shocked that the lens array was sufficient that the point spread function could resolve the 12 micron pixels I had. So we'll get to that in the discussion, but please keep this interactive. Please, please interrupt me. It's your time. You came, you came out. I really want to answer all your questions as best I can. So, so it is a functional near eye display, and while the resolution is not superb, in terms of pixels per degree or cycles per degree, it's comparable to something like an Oculus Rift already in prototype form. So this is just to show you that the light field resolution loss can be tolerable. Okay, so I, at the end of the day, I am an NVIDIA. And so what's interesting about this project, we've, we've changed the game optically, right? Everyone's been stuck having fairly bulky head mounts since <coughs> Ivan Sutherland, because they used the solution Ivan came up with, and many others did even before Ivan, which is a big magnifying lens in front of a small display, right? Because we've replaced it with a bunch of small micro lenses, we've made it thin. But we now have to render a light field, right? Which is more involved than rendering a stereo pair, right? All existing 3D displays, glasses free or otherwise, or head mounts, they only just render stereo pairs, right? In this case, for each lenslet, you have to render a different off-axis perspective projection of the scene. So in this lenslet array that's going around, you know, counted up, you're already rendering hundred <coughs> views. You have two of those, you're rendering a couple hundred views. If you were to do a wider field of view, you might get to a thousand views. But you don't want to have to have a thousand graphics cards, although I am an NVIDIA, I'd like to sell you a thousand <laughs> graphics cards, or at least a couple really nice graphics cards. But this is all manageable, right? This is the, the real SIGGRAPH part of SIGGRAPH. We can, we can figure out how to render light fields. That's not the problem. The problem was optics. So the important thing is if you get the calibration correct, when looking through the micro lens array, this is the raw image being displayed on the right eyepiece OLED panel, so right behind the lens array. All of those images superimpose on the retina, and if you focus at the correct depth, they shift and superimpose. So this is exactly the algorithm Lytro uses to refocus a light field, right? So in a, light, in a Lytro light field camera, say you have Jensen Swartz car, you take a photograph of it, this is the raw image you get on a Lytro camera. And then computationally, you take each of these sub-images and you shift them and superimpose them, and that's the actual focus, that is a simplified version of the focusing and re refocusing algorithm Lytro or anyone else uses. So in reverse, what we do is we render this array of images, we view them through a lens array. Each of these is a small projector, projecting an image onto your retina, and then your eye, the cornea and lens, as they deform to focus at a given plane, your eye is functioning as it does in reality, which is it's an optical computer running the refocusing algorithm Lytro uses, right? When you focus, all of these things shift and superimpose. So that's the way you can understand what I did as the reverse of a Lytro camera. Yes? From the, again, a little bit off this one. Uh, how are you managing the uh, reflected light and how much light <coughs> comes through? Or what's the, or what's the right, so it as a prototype, all, all of it. Yeah, so as a prototype, we're not managing it at all. Okay. We'll take the lens, no anti-reflection coatings, no special interfaces, okay. no you, get, coating you get reflections all over the place. And when I pass this around, the important thing is you see an image. From here, I'm giving the same talk at the Bay Area Society of Information Displays in a couple weeks. Right. Then we'll dive into the, the real optics. But in the short order, just like many things, to first order, you can ignore the nuances and hope that good optical engineers come and solve your problems. But it's not a limiting factor. For instance, the scattering, the absorption between the micro lenses, the chromatic aberrations, all of those things are ignored. Quality control, all of right. All of those things are ignored, yet you still see an image with decent contrast. Yeah, yeah. So with any reflection coatings, with chromatic aberration correction, I think we're better off. Yes? What about trying to use some sort of sensor to figure out how far you are from the head? Because then you can manage to render only those pixels that the person looking at it actually sees at which point the rendering time is much less of an yeah. issue. Yeah, you're absolutely going in the right track. So there was a very interesting uh, project from SIGGRAPH Research uh, that looked at foveated rendering. And it was uh, shown in the exact same ETEC session. Uh, and so the idea behind this project was, say you have a large you know, gigapixel display, right? the whole wall is a display. How are you going to render for that? Well, if you have a gaze tracker, you can do foveated rendering and just render at high resolution directly in your field of view. And so applying that idea in a head mount is a great idea. And I think 
you know, being in research, one of the reasons I pursued this is to start to understand the head mount world. And I think after working on this project and looking at other head mounts, I think there's a great argument for putting eye trackers in any head mounted or wearable device. You, there's not just for rendering purposes, you get so much when you throw in a camera to watch the eye or some other method to watch the eye. So I, yes, I agree. How do you measure the quality of the display for different eyes with different uh, you know, impairments to so-called 20 century or and so on? Yeah, so we'll get to that. So the, one of the unique aspects of a light field is you can actually bake in the correction of your optical aberrations into how you render. So if you are nearsighted or farsighted, no. you can actually change these images, just shift them and perturb them, and you can correct astigmatism, myopia, hyperopia, presbyopia, all of the normal things that your glasses correct. And it's the same way, in the way that a lens, right, if I'm nearsighted, I put on a lens, and what it does is it brings everything in the world, it compresses it in depth. Because if I'm nearsighted, I can take my glasses off and see things close to me. So if I put a lens in, all it's doing is it's moving the audience into the range I can focus on. So you can do the exact same thing to the synthetic content, and then you don't need your eyeglasses anymore. You're presenting a light field in your natural accommodation range. So there's always this dual, right? We can do in computation what optics could do, or what optics can do, we can do in computation, right? And that's the interesting story I've learned, having worked on both sides of this problem, right? There's always this strange duality that doesn't always match. And any issues for an army gas mask, someone is wearing, or a motorbike mask, uh, thing that if someone is wearing, yes. the eye glass, is there any correction there? Have you looked at that application? So, so this device is focused on virtual reality, not optical see-through augmented reality. Okay. So we'll get to that, okay. yeah. So, so this is the nutshell of the project. So why would you do this versus the traditional solutions, right? So the argument, I think there are four reasons you might choose to use a light field design for a head mount rather than a more traditional design like the big lens you see floating around, right? So first off, my personal bugaboo is that for virtual reality, right? Playing video games, playing first person shooters, right? The things like that we're seeing coming onto the market are incredibly exciting, right? I'm a huge fan of the Oculus Rift. Now, how many of you have heard of the Rift? Silicon Valley, so nearly everyone. If you haven't, I strongly encourage you to come to the Silicon Valley Virtual Reality Meetup, or at least go and look at this. It's, it is very exciting, and it's you know, one of the reasons I'm even more excited about this field. But the way it works is it basically takes your cell phone, it actually takes a Nexus 7 screen, I think, for the current prototype, crams it up against your face, but not too close, and then puts a single lens, sort of like the multi-lens we see floating around. And because it only uses one lens, you still need a long focal length, so it's still thick. But because it's a single lens, you have to correct distortions on the screen. That's fine. The important thing about that is it only costs $300, which is why everyone's super excited about this as a consumer product. But if I could have anything I want, I would want that Rift experience, same price, but thin and light. right? Because I used to play first-person shooters back when they sort of started out. Right? In high school, I was with one of my first friends to start doing LAN parties back with Doom, or even Wolfenstein. Well, Wolfenstein didn't have LAN party capability, but we, I sort of grew up with the first person shooter. And you know, playing video games all weekend with my friends all night, I'm suspicious whether we can have these ski goggle-like devices and be really comfortable. It gets sweaty, it gets uncomfortable, but it's amazingly fun. So I think this is where there could be an argument made that the advantage of a light field is it gets you to thin and lightweight. You have to give up a lot, which is resolution, but you get somewhere that traditional optics can't get you. The other thing, you know, if you've used the Oculus Rift, the reason it's, another, yet another reason it's so exciting is it has a very wide field of view, right? So existing head mounts, like the Sony and other devices, they weren't even called virtual reality systems. They were called personal media viewers. That's how they were marketed. Because the experience they give you, you put on the glasses, and you see something like a 40-degree field of view. So everything goes dark and it feels like you're in a darkened movie theater with a big screen. So that's fine for watching a movie on a plane or if you have a super tiny apartment in Tokyo. That's great. It, actually, it sells really well there because of that reason. But if your goal is to play virtual reality video games, you're cranking your head around, you know, you're looking everywhere. You know, a 40 degree field of view is like looking through a keyhole at your game. It's just not compelling. And the Rift has shown us that just by being clever in your design, Instead of using micro displays, but by using cell phone screens, you can get that 90 degree field of view. And if you use a Rift, you'll see that you're never going to go back. Right? So I used to work on 3D scanning uh, in my master's degree phase. 
And around the time I was finishing up that phase, Microsoft Connect came out. And I felt, well, that put a nail in the coffin. If you're doing 3D scanning research and you're not better than a Connect, there's absolutely no point. And I think that moment has now come where industry, through the Rift, has set a stake in the ground. If you don't have a 90 degree field of view for your head mount and it's intended for virtual reality, you might as well go home, right? No one's gonna play video games on that, right? And so the nice thing about the light field design is if you have a large enough display underneath, right? If that lens array was bigger and the display underneath was bigger, the field of view also expands. So this technology has support, although with future display, displays, to reach the 90 degree or more field of view. So the fourth reason, which I actually think is the most important, is that it's comfortable, right? So I used to work on 3D displays, and clearly they failed in the market, right? The movies, we still see 3D movies around, and that may have a lot to do with the fact that distributors and everyone else makes a lot more money when you pay the extra $3, right? But the one reason I think 3D TV, 3D gaming, 3D entertainment in general has always been a fad is that it's a poor approximation of our true 3D experience of the world, right? 2D displays are a good approximation of looking at a photograph, right? Dynamic range may not be quite as good, there may be some color gamut artifacts, but a 2D display is a great 2D display. With 3D imaging, all existing 3D displays, stereoscopes, head mounts, view masters, everything, the only thing it does is it gives your right eye and left eye view a slightly different perspective of the world. You get stereo, binocular disparity, right? But human vision is far more nuanced, right? When I look at my finger, all of you go out of focus, and vice versa, right? So that's known as retinal defocus, and in many cases, that tells us a lot more about depth than actual binocular disparity, right? Because when something's blurred out, disparity doesn't really tell us anything about the depth, but the blur certainly does, right? So I think. This is why 3D displays have always been a pale approximation and an uncomfortable approximation of the world. So in the 3D movie world, one of the bugaboos, so you'll read, if you go to, to Robert, Eger, Robert Eber, Roger Ebert's uh, website, he has a whole tirade against 3D movies and he complains that the problem with them is a combination convergence conflict. I actually disagree that in the movie, you don't actually have this problem that often. But the problem being, if this was a 3D movie and you were all wearing those real D glasses, right, polarized glasses, if something floated off the screen, say the Stanford Bunny because we're in a cigarette, right, you'd converge on it. And normally what happens is when your eyes converge, right, the cornea deforms or your eye focuses just like a camera at the plane you're converging at, right? So as you bring your finger in, not only do your eyes rotate to converge on it, they also continue to focus on it so that the background is blurred out. If you do that in a 3D film, what happens? The object floats out, you converge, and once you start focusing on that object, the whole screen is thrown out of focus, which means the whole world blurs. So that's known as accommodation convergence conflict, and that means when you're in a 3D movie, your eye has to unlearn what was natural for however many decades you've been alive, which is convergence and accommodation should be the same. So you actually learned, you unlearn that cue and accommodation turns off. And you always accommodate on theater screens so things are sharp, sharply in focus, and you converge as things move. And for two hours, that's a fine experience. Three hours for some movies, right? So for 30 hours, like I used to play video games, that's not so comfortable, right? And so having these cues, I think, are very important. And not only is it important to make accommodation and convergence match, it's also important that when I verge and accommodate at a point, the other points in the scene are appropriately blurred. Because that is an, yet another depth clue, cue that's very important to stimulate to have a comfortable experience. Yeah? Um, I've actually seen it mentioned that one of the problems with, with the 3D movies is fairly often uh, one of the traditional filmmaking things is to focus on, to actually have a fairly small depth of field and focus on one thing and the things that are out of focus are acute you that you're not supposed to be paying attention to any of those. Whereas the problem with 3D is, um, it is that using that as a cue starts to make things go funky because those things are out of focus, but you can tell that they're way back there. Right. And I've seen that criticized a fair amount. Yeah, so actually I think it might have been three years ago now, Cigarette had a special session, whenever it was in LA last, that uh, was on 3D cinematography, and they brought in the director of 3D photography for several movies. One of them 
his greatest credit was the Miley Cyrus 3D film, which was excellent, by the way. No. And uh, I think the same guy might have done the U2 3D. And so they talked about exactly these strategies. How do you want is to just crank up the resolution. This is the solution for light field cameras. If you want a 5 megapixel image out, buy a 25 megapixel camera, 30 megapixel camera, right? The sky's the limit for CMOS sensors in some ways, so you can do that. In displays, we're somewhat constrained, right? You can't go out to Best Buy and buy a two-inch diagonal 8K display at the moment, right? So, so you, you know, this is what makes this an emerging technology, not an emerged one. But we can tile, and I don't have time to go into it today, but it turns out using this lenslet array, unlike a tiled display wall, we can completely hide the seams between tiled micro displays. We can hide it uh, so that you basically just lose a little bit of the eye box, which means that the, 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 the ability to tolerate the glasses slipping on your face will be somewhat compromised. So it's, it's a nuance, but an important one. Yeah? I was wondering about the uh, resolution and depth, and also like the uh, build of depth is, like the near and far that you can focus on. What, what are the factors that affect that? Great question. So in a couple slides, I'll be showing you the mega chart uh -huh. that shows the entire complex trade space that if you muck with one thing, here's what you lose exactly. And I'll give you the normal answer, which is see the paper. So this will be coming out as a SIGGRAPH Asia technical paper next month. And so that the meat of this work, right? This is just a lens array on the screen. So the real meat is understanding exactly what you said. What are the trades? If I have a lens pitch of one millimeter and a focal length of two, what do I get? Is it a 35 degree depth field of view? Is it a 55? What's my workable depth of field? And so when we get to that slide, I'll come back to the answer to that because we'll have some visuals to help. But roughly, the accommodation range is that for a 40 year old at the moment. So it's four diopters. So, short answer. Yeah, there's, you can project from infinity or? Optical, in, beyond optical infinity down to 25 centimeters. So roughly four diopters, although there's a little bit on the other end to handrail correction for hyperopia. Uh, okay, so the real lesson on this project, right, is not surprisingly, the most important thing to do, buy the absolute best uh, micro display you can afford, and then be very careful with the micro lens selection. Right? The thing I'm passing around is a decent <coughs> set of micro lenses for the display I have, but it's not the perfect one. Perfect being somewhat subjective. And the reason is it costs a lot to have a custom diamond turn lens array made, whereas if you just get off the shelf parts like I did, you'll have somewhat inferior parameter selection. Okay, so to make this viable, right? When would this light field near eye display concept be viable for a consumer product? Well, two things need to happen. First, we're going to need slightly larger micro displays, right? So state of the art micro displays, the mass consumer item. So where do you think micro, micro displays, little tiny displays show up the most in gadgets you're carrying around? Any guesses? Do you find on camera? Absolutely, double points. <laughs> so uh, these are actually Sony designed very beautiful OLEDs for their high-end, you know, Nexus 7 type cameras, the electronic viewfinder. And then they did a prestige project where they basically took an FPGA, drove two viewfinders, and added this nice optic, right? So electronic viewfinders are driving OLEDs, which unfortunately is not mobile mass consumer technology, right? So we're not riding the same curve as something like the Oculus Rift is, right? You want to tie yourself to cell phones because you know those will improve every year. So that's one problem with this approach. We're tied to micro displays. We need larger ones than we can currently get what we can tile. And then of course, well this is the second problem I'll get to in a minute. The other issue we need is higher resolution micro displays. And that is happening, right? So the industry has decided that 3D has mostly failed with everyone here, but we all want you to buy a new HDTV, right? And so how are we gonna sell it to you? Or it's gonna be a new HDTV, right? We're moving from 2K, or sorry, we're moving from HD to 4K, right? So I, and then from 4K, obviously we're going to jump to 8K in cinemas. 640K should be a <coughs> one. Yes. <laughs> right. so, so much like 3D, whether you believe in this transition doesn't really matter. The industry does, and it's happening. And so I can tie our technology to that curve, right? The OLEDs in projectors, sorry, micro displays, not OLEDs in, in projectors, overhead projectors, as well as electronic viewfinders will also follow this curve and they'll move to 4K and ultimately to 8K. And that'll give me the ridiculous pixel count I need to use a light field approach. All right, so the, one of the real weaknesses of this approach and also a strength 
is that it requires knowledge of the user's vision, right? So one of the nice things we can do is we can eliminate the need for eyeglasses, right? So this is a big question for wearables, right? If you're nearsighted, farsighted, and have astigmatism, most of us have some visual aberrations, right? You wear contact lenses or glasses. But with a head mount, say you're wearing glasses, right? You know, you're not just four-eyed now, now you're six-eyed, right? You have two displays, glasses, and your normal eyes. So for something like the Oculus Rift, that's fine, because you, know, you can try to cram your glasses underneath, but you know, it's, it's actually sort of difficult even with the Rift's design. And so what they do is they ship you a bag of lenses in the current implementation. And if you're nearsighted, you swap out the lenses, and if you're farsighted, you swap in another one, which is a, a very good solution for now. But it always means you're not quite getting the best experience, right? If you're a little more farsighted than the next guy, that plane is no longer quite at optical infinity. It's close, but not quite. So it's, it's not a one-size-fits-all technique. But with the light field display, it is one-size-fits-all, fits all, right? If your vision suddenly changes, we can just change how we, we render but we need to know your vision, right? So you'll actually see what I've implemented in the demo is a bit of a, an eye test, right? So you sit down and put my glasses on and I'll actually do an eye test and figure out how much nearsightedness you have, what's your inner pupillary distance, and then you'll be able to bake that in. But that's also a weakness. I mean, in general, if I ask a random person in the room, you know, about 10% seem to know the actual diopter value of their eyeglasses, right? I don't know how many, how many of you actually know? Yeah, so this is why I don't actually support in the, the demo the ability to type in your prescription. Almost no one knows their prescription, uh, so that's one limitation. All right, so that's the idea in a nutshell. And now I'll try to, as quickly as possible, give you a sense of the nuances behind all of this. So where did this idea come from? Well, light fields are not new in any way, right? So with Lytro, right? Four or five years ago, there was a huge press buzz, right? They got 50 million in venture funding. Light fields were the new thing, but they weren't the new thing, right? Light fields date back. The first papers are around in the turn of the last century, right? Frederick Ives and, Carol, and sorry, Frederick Ives and Gabriel Lippmann, who Gabriel Lippmann actually won a Nobel Prize for color <coughs> photography. So, you know, very notable individuals realized long ago that take a piece of film, a little lens lit array on top, you can capture multiple views. Develop that film. Blue lens lit array on top, now you can project multiple views, right? So turn of the last century, they invented light field cameras and light field displays. Unfortunately, the technology curve they were writing took a while to give us digital sensors and digital displays, right? So that's really what happened, right? So in my previous life, life as a graduate student, right, I, I was constantly applying for DARPA funding. And there are always two questions that DARPA program managers are told to ask. And I, I really like this. The two they're told to ask is why you and why now? And so I always felt the why you was pointless because you're just going to get an egotistical answer. But the why now is always the most important question to ask, right? Why is this startup happening? Why didn't this happen 10 years ago? Or why will it take 20 years? And so why light fields are happening now are semiconductor technology, right? We've written Moore's Law, and all of a sudden we have 30 megapixel CMOS sensors that are one inch diagonal. And so we can afford to give up all that re resolution by gluing a very naive lens array on top. <coughs> And we get back the ability to refocus, no problem, right? So in some sense, I think the story is good for the idea of doing this on the display side, right? We just had to wait for cameras to get high enough res, and now we're getting light field cameras. If we wait for displays, and that's where the argument is, how long will we have to wait? The same thing will apply. And so thinking about the 3D display world, I recently saw Dolby's 4K TV coated with a lens lit array. It was actually the best glasses-free experience I ever had. Right? It, was, it was very compelling, and it wasn't any different than what Philips did maybe a decade ago. The only difference was they used a 4K display. Right? So it's brute force off the wind problems, and so I think it's believable to think that we'll have high enough resolution displays to do the light field trick. All right, so those are all prior art in a sense. What's really important is what is the state of the art for head-mounted displays? So I'm planning to do a tutorial at SIGGRAPH, I'll at least uh, I'll try to do one, on the whole space of head mounts, because I spent the last year spending a lot of time learning about them. But I can cut to the chase and tell you what I think is the most interesting project you should be aware of, besides my own, of course. <laughs> so uh, if you're interested in Google Glass or virtual reality, the most interesting device out there, in my opinion, is a waveguide near-eye display. So how many of you have heard of this? Yeah. 
trying to see how many of you are wearing Google Glass. So this is where Google Glass should go, in my opinion, although I'm just an engineer, what do I know? Um, what's great about this technique is that you can see in this prototype, this is from an Israeli company, what they do is they, they have a sheet of glass. It's about anywhere from two to three millimeters thick. And they have a pair of Pico projectors at the edge, right? And, and to project an image into your eye, it's a very clever idea. You project <coughs> into the side of the glass, and then by total internal reflection, we bounce around. Now the question is, how do we get out of the glass? That's where all the magic lives. So many companies have many different ideas on how to get out. But the idea is you have an outcoupling element that basically breaks the total internal reflection and sends rays back into your eye. So I learned about this. A couple months after I started on the light field project, and I said, oh, well, this is great. Other than the temple projectors, which are currently big, which can all obviously shrink, this has a three centimeter thick optical stack, which is roughly the thickness I have. So, so am I dead? You know? Can I go to Jensen and say, well, we're done. This is the company we should be watching. There's actually many companies doing this, not just one. I think the answer is no at the moment. So there are several limitations with this approach that are shared with many existing head mounts. So one of the big ones is that because you're using total internal reflection, you're limited in field of view, right? So remember Oculus Rift, one of the reasons it's exciting is 90 degree field of view. So if you used a waveguide for a VR device, you wouldn't get the 90 degree field of view, unless you did things that are much more exotic than what's being proposed, right? And Google Glass is already, what, 16 degrees or so, 15-ish. So you'd get a little more than that, but you're not dramatically changing it, right? If you're moving this into the center of your field of view, you're still looking through that keyhole. It's just a slightly bigger keyhole. So limited field of view is the biggest weakness of this. Second of all, I think this is very important for augmented reality. When you're seeing through, this device can only create images at optical infinity, right? So that means in this room, I could create a stereo sensation of an object infinitely far away. But what if I'm floating an arrow or a text over someone who I forgot their name of, right? This is all the stuff we saw in the Google Glass concept video. It's a beautiful concept, and we all want it to happen. But the question is, how do you make that optically happen, right? And if you can only create objects at optical infinity, you're going to have a lot of trouble with accommodation convergence as you're verging throughout the room and focusing everywhere. So I think this is OK, and I really hope this comes to market uh, in a consumer product, because it will be really interesting. But long term, it has some, some key weaknesses. The other weaknesses are more of a nuance, which are, it has a limited field of view, like I mentioned, and the eye box, the region your pupil can move over, is very small. <coughs> so if you try one of these prototypes, they have a little ratchet on your nose piece to make sure it's exactly positioned, right? So if, you know, you wear glasses like I do in the evenings, if you sweat at all or turn your head down, your glasses slip, right? The eye box is so small that you fall out of it, and now you see an incorrect image, right? So this is... The challenge is, and of course DARPA is very heavily invested in these concepts and are moving all of these limitations out. But there's only so far you can go with the field of view with the existing approach. So I'd be watching this, but with some uh, happy skepticism. Uh, so then, in the SIGGRAPH community, the biggest debt I owe, not surprisingly, is to my advisor at MIT. Right? So essentially all my career I owe to my advisor. But he actually started down this road uh, several years before I even considered it, he had a series of projects I wasn't involved with called Netra and Taylor Displays. Uh, this was presented at SIGGRAPH. How many of you have heard of Netra? It got quite a lot of press coverage at the time. Uh, I really encourage you to, to look at this. It's interesting, of course, in its own right. The idea was to take a cell phone display and to put an attachment on top of it. And then, this is my friend Ankit, who just sold his company to Google. Uh, so. Uh, what he did is he had an optical stack here. In one, one implementation, it had an array of lenses and masks and all sorts of optical things. But at the end of the day, you, project, you, you put a set of interlaced images on the screen, and you projected a light field into the eye. Essentially the same thing I'm proposing. It's just they started with the cell phone screen, and they weren't so concerned about making it thin, because it's not a virtual reality gadget. It's a, you know, it's a device for optometry, right? It's a medical device. And so, with this device, you can very accurately project a set of two, a, a, a pair of lines, right? And so what you do when you, when you take your eye test, you, you take your cell phone, you put the attachment on, you press the up arrow and down arrow on the phone until the red line lines up with the green line. And you do that a few times for different orientations, 
And that gives you enough equations for solving the three unknowns that matter, which are the spherical, cylindrical, and axis parameters of your eyeglasses prescription. So it eliminates the need for an optometrist, uh, in particular for the developing world. So Ramesh, as a startup, hopefully I show, oh, I think I have to go back a slide. It's called iNetra, and it's based in Cambridge, Massachusetts, if you want to read more. So the kernel of this idea is, is definitely started with Netra. So the real approach to this project was to take the same con concept, try to miniaturize it, and look at this trade space that we're discussing very carefully so that we can get as much resolution out as possible for a general entertainment or display application. All right. It's an illustration. I am it Exactly. Yeah, so you know, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, so that's why Ramesh chose it. Uh, it means I. Um, yeah. Um, I wanted to ask, what the stuff that was being done by microvision, which was they were attempting to use a very low power laser and just simply project images directly on the retina. What yes. about that? So the name of so so this approach to head mount displays, by various terms, the one that matters is Wikipedia. It's called direct retinal projection. That's the Wikipedia page you'll find. And the idea, you know, people always come up to this over time is they say, well, why can't I just take a laser pointer and sort of steer it so it goes into my pupil and then just raster scan onto the retina, right? And that's the basic idea of direct retinal projection. If you've been following the tech news like Engadget, there's a startup called uh, Avogante, I think, that's doing a new iteration of the microvision approach, apparently. Uh, I don't know much about it other than the, the press coverage. Or that's all I know. Uh, the, I looked into that. and. The problem is, at the end of the day, if you have a point on your retina, right, and you're looking at infinity, that corresponds essentially to a bundle of rays going off in one direction, right? So there has to be an optical element somewhere along that bundle of rays that steers your laser pointer from that point into your eye. So if I want to see a 2D image, it implies I need a 2D surface in front of my eye to create, to take the laser pointer and fold it and project it back into your eye. And so the direct retinal projection is a bit of a red herring. You end up using essentially identical optics as all existing head mounts. The only thing that changes is you replace a micro display with a pico projector that raster scans an image plane that's been re-imaged by a bunch of lenses and reflected off a set of mirrors. So direct retinal projection, as I understand it, has the exact same volume traits. It doesn't really change the optics of getting something into your eye. It changes the optics of how you generate an image. And that's my own take on it. If someone understands it with better nuance, please email me so I don't spread false information. But that's what I could discover looking at Microvision's website and, and the, the academic papers from the uh, University of Washington that came from. OK. So this is sort of the high level optical question I had to answer, right? So it's already getting late. So I'm, I'm not going to bore you with a bunch of math. Uh, I'm just going to give you a high level concept of what I had to solve. So this is the academic part of the work. Remember the idea is very simple. We take a micro display, whatever you care to use, an, an LCD, an LCOS, uh, a DMD, whatever. It's a planar display, and in front of that display we place an array of micro lenses. Right? So go back to high school optics. A micro lens can be treated as an array of perfect thin lenses. And a thin lens in this case only has two parameters. It's focal length, which is its thickness, right? and the pitch. What is the distance between the center of each micro lens? So to design this head mount, right, the, the, the little lens you saw going around, I had to choose two numbers. right. So given an OLED panel, what is the optimal focal length and lens pitch to give me some set of specifications I'm trying to reach? Wide field of view, high resolution, you know, thin form factor. right. So that's the, the game. And so we had a, a natural question. Do we want a bunch of tiny micro lenses and just like cameras, there are F number limits for micro lenses, right? So an F1.0 micro lens is hard to get. <coughs> and that would mean its width is roughly equal to its focal length. So if you have small lenses, you can have a short, thin device, which is what we all want. If you have wider lenses, you must have a longer focal length, which means a thicker device. So how many pixels do we cover up on the underlying display? And once you do this analysis, do you in fact determine that the best design is one big lens far away that we've been doing all along? So the brief answer to this question is all three of those designs have merit, depending on what you're going for. 
So that Sony magnifier that's going around is of this flavor, and it's great if you don't care about thickness, and all you want is a very high resolution image over a rel relatively modest field of view, right? But if you care about thickness, then you're in the space I'm dealing with, which is move to an array and be thin. And as you move left and right here, you trade off parameters in a somewhat complex way. So I'm going to skip this slide. I think we understand how blurred images work. I'm going to skip this too. It's already late. I'm going to jump to the chase, which is when you, when you download the SIGGRAPH Asia paper, if you're interested, this is the key result in the entire work, I think, which is the trade space we were discussing earlier. Right? So say you're trying to design a head mount. Right? What do you really care about? What will consumers ultimately care about? Well, if you simplify things, you basically have a two-dimensional trade space. You can vary focal length of the lens and the pitch of the lens array. And this shaded top left corner is the area that physics and practicality don't really allow you to access. This is an F number less than one. Right? So for those of you who are photographers, I don't think any of you have an F.5 lens. If you do, I'd love to see it. It's probably amazing. <laughs> right? I think Stanley Kubrick was the only one to have something like that. Uh, so, so the top left corner is prohibited, but anywhere in this space we could design the system. And so the things you ultimately would care about, what is the resolution, right? That's the first thing everyone asks nowadays with head mounts. Oh, you're making a competitor to the Rift. What is the resolution? Oh, there's a new Rift. What's the resolution? Oh, I hear there's a new Google Glass. What's the resolution? That's, that's the spec we all care about, for better or worse, right? The next thing we might care about is field of view, which I actually think is somewhat more important depending on your application. If you're going for virtual reality, this better be a big number, right? The third one is a subtle point now. This is how many lenses span the micro display. So if you have one lens, you have a traditional design. It gives you stereo but no accommodation. If you have many small lenses, just like a Lytro camera, it gives you accommodation convergence, you can correct your eyeglasses prescription, and the number of lenses matter for the, the ability to accommodate for eyeglasses prescription. If you only have a few, you may not be able to carefully correct. Defocused objects may not appear as a smooth blur. They may appear as 16 small images close to each other, or four small images. So this is a, a bit hard to explain, but that's the idea. The last one is the one that most head mounted display engineers, you know, this is the bane of their existence, right? So, so Google Glass, I actually don't know anyone on the team other than Mark LeBoy who's working on the camera. I'd love to speak to someone about the trades they made, but this is what all head mounts have to worry about, right? So the question is, you create this viewing zone, right, where your pupil can be located. So when you put on any head mount, there's this box, basically. And if your eye stays in the box, you see a nice, sharp, beautiful image. And if you move outside the box, you start to get strong vignetting or complete artifacts, right? And the goal, of course, is to make this box as big as possible without compromising anything else. And this is a human factors problem, right? Human eyes are separated by a range of distances between ch children and adults, men and women, right? And so that distribution you can get from the Army data tables from the 60s, I think. This is what the same sort of ugly Xerox plot I see in every paper. And that tells you the IPD range, the interpupillary distance for all humans as of the late 60s. And then you have to sort of choose. OK, well, if I have a large field of view, I'm going to need a large eye box because the eye can rotate around. And if, the, if these things aren't strapped to my head tightly, I need a larger eye box because they can bounce around on my face. So in this design, you can see this black line I plotted. This is a one centimeter eye box, which is about as small. You know, just make your hands about a centimeter and put it about two, an inch from your face to mix units, right? That would be something like a 40-ish degree field of view, maybe, roughly. Uh, and then you can move around, and that's what you could see, right? But really, this box, there are two boxes we're talking about. This is the range over which your eye could move, right? So this is about as small as you can tolerate 40 degrees. And then these black lines are at one centimeter eye box projected into the other spaces. And then we interpolate along these lines, and that gives us these three plots here. So what this is saying is, as a designer, I've said, OK, I must have a one centimeter eye box. No larger, no smaller. Now as I vary focal length, because varying focal length fixes lens pitch, right? As I vary the focal length, what resolution do I get? So you can actually see, according to thin lens, you know, Gaussian optics, I must have a lens greater than about two centimeters thick. The Sony thing cannot be thinner than two centimeters and still create a full resolution image. 
If it gets any thinner, you have an F number less than one, right? And then there's a gap where you can't have a viable design. There's a very strange thing I don't have time to explain, but then you get the microlens solution. And it has a strange scalp appearance, but you can sort of look at the upper envelope. That's the upper bound on its resolution. So it turns out it's falling off as the focal length over the focal length plus the distance from the eye of the display. So this is sort of the fundamental trait that governs direct light field applications for near eye. And the solution I chose, sorry, so the top right is actually what the Sony HMB has, right? Bottom left is where the prototype I'm about to pass around lives. So it's a 3.3 millimeter focal length. It has roughly 200 pixels across. So we're down by about a factor of six from our 1280 by 720p panel, five or six. Keep in mind that light field cameras are usually down by a factor of 10 or more. Right? So we're in a decent regime, but we're still needing something more like a 4K panel, not a normal HD panel. Field of view is comparable a little better than existing systems, and that's because the optics aren't so far away from the display itself. They've moved closer, so field of view has improved. And then this is the depth of field I think you were asking about earlier, which is if I just look at a single lens, it's like the magnifier. As I shrink the lens, right, it's like stopping down a camera in a way, the depth of field expands. Right? And as I open the, sorry, other yeah, depth of field expands as I make a larger lens, it becomes shallow. Right? So in this solution, if I have a large lens, which means a large focal length, this point, I have no depth of field really. But it doesn't matter because that's an existing head mount. I just put one plane at infinity. It looks like a movie screen at infinity. If I try to move objects off that screen, I immediately have no resolution because I have no accommodation ability. So that's a traditional design. In the light field design, these dashed white lines show the near and far planes of accommodations in linear units, not diopters. And so what you'll notice is as you decrease the focal length, you, know, you lose resolution, but your accommodation range. So this range means you get 200 pixels across the field of view no matter where the object is located. So again, the paper derives all this, but it's just sort of simple geometry to, to work out. Do you have any way to actually test that optically to see yeah, the so, resolution and depth plus? Yeah, so the lenses we have are not perfect thin lenses. So achieving you know, this F number limit probably doesn't occur in them. You know, we didn't do MTF tests of them. We sort of heuristically saw that if we present an image, it's 200 pixels across, you know, put a sinusoid or a chirp, you don't get strong aliasing artifacts. So it's very heuristic because the focus here is more on the whole overall system concept than you know, the, the optical details. But those are things we have subsequently looked at. And it requires careful lab work to, to really quantify accurately. Uh, okay, so again, that's all thin lens theory. All right, so in the last few minutes, I want to jump to the fun part. So you've all been patient. Now I can actually show you some real prototypes. So again, I like to publish at SIGGRAPH, or at least try to. And my favorite thing about SIGGRAPH, even though it's sometimes disappointing to get your paper rejected, the best part of applying, submitting a paper for review is you can send physical supplements. Right? This is the coolest part of SIGGRAPH. I mean, I don't know of other communities that allow this. The reason I have this little gadget I'll be passing around, I'll actually start it now as I'm explaining it. I'll send you two, and then I'll explain what you're seeing put one at the back so there's time. So please bring these up at the end. I spent a lot of blood, sweat, and tears to make these. So uh, hopefully it'll come home to me. So this device is very simple. Basically, it's a backlight from a, an old GPS that I ripped apart and just took the backlight panel out. So it's about a one millimeter thick piece of plastic with an LED at the edge that gives a uniform light box. On top of that, I have a high resolution film so I can simulate any micro display by putting a piece of film on top of a light box. So this is a micro display you might be able to buy in three to five years, right? Which is the sort of time frame researchers to care about. So it's about 3.75 by 3.75 centimeters, which is bigger than any micro display you can get at the moment. And it's 3000 DPI, which is actually quite common for a nice micro display, right? So 120 pixels per millimeter, 10 times more than a retina display, which is not exotic at all for an electronic viewfinder. That's what you need for an electronic viewfinder. So when you get this device, underneath the lens array, right? if we're trying to depict a bird, what's actually depicted are hundreds of views of the bird, one for each lens, so thousands of views of the bird in this case. This is what it should look like 
But remember, this device is not strapped to your head, it's not tuned for your vision, and it's been dropped a bunch since SIGGRAPH. <laughs> but this is what you should do when you get the device. So basically, pull it up to your face, and you'll see a video in a second. But you should be viewing it from maybe an inch or two from your eye. So it's a near eye display, right? It's not a 3D display, it's a near eye display. And oops, this is what it should look like. So you start to bring it up to your face, and then you'll see a nice clean image of all the license plates over a 70 degree field of view. So with this prototype, we can already get close to an Oculus Rift or a nice clean view of this bird, right? But what you'll notice, I can pause this for a second. Nope, let's go back. So what you'll notice here, if I start it again, you'll actually see a bunch of periodic views of the image. And that's because just like a 3D, glasses for 3D display, you get periodic repetition of your field of view. So if you ever go to a trade show like SIGGRAPH and you see a glasses free 3D display, right, as you walk from left to right, you'll get a stereo view, but at some point, you know, the Stanford Bunny, which they always show, will jump, right? And that's because you've wrapped around the field of view of the lenses, right? So all of a sudden you get an inverted stereo pair and then the first stereo pair you got on the right hand side. And that exact same effect happens in this device, but what happens is we have an, an infinite eye box. So I'm not aware of any existing head mount that has an infinite eye box. We actually do have an infinite one, but it's periodic, right? So you'll, as this thing is going around, you'll see these little squares, right? And if you don't believe this is a 3D display, set it down on the floor and look down on it, and then both eyes can enter the eye box, and you'll actually see a bird or a license plate floating below the floor, right? And then when you bring that up to your face and your pupil enters one of these viewing zones completely, then you'll see just one image. Keep in mind, when the actual prototype's on your face, I can get this at the right distance, so you don't, you're not able to see all these infinite copies, right? So this is sort of a nuance of the fact that you have a wearable display that's not on your face. And I'm gonna skip that, that's a nuance. Okay, so the last little thing I wanna show you was actually one of the easier aspects of the project. At this point, you really understand everything, but being in a video, I wanna play a video game. I don't just wanna look at images of birds, right? So what I did was I built this little simple device I showed earlier, and here's how I did it. So first of all, again, I didn't want to spend a lot of money on this project, so I want to get a pair of OLED panels, the best I can get for the least cost. The best ones you can get under those conditions are in Gilroy. Go to the Sony store, ask for a refurbished HMZ T1, and they usually don't ask questions and tell them you want to buy five or six because you're going to break a lot, and then rip it apart, and you can reassemble it into any head mount you want. And so it's actually a great platform. I was talking to Palmer Lucky, who's the founder of Oculus, uh, who did the Rift, and he actually used to experiment with these systems back when he started. Uh, they're, they're, they're very nice for, for the price. How much so, are they? what? How much are they refurbished? Refurbished, they're 400. 400 to 500. They keep varying, and the supply is starting to dry up because they've now introduced the HMZ T2 in Europe. They now have the T3 and the T3 wireless, but they never come back to America for some reason. So, when you rip this open, Essentially, it has a driver electronics board and a bunch of OLED uh, circuit board drivers. Sorry, it's going to click twice. So you can find teardowns on YouTube of the HMZ T1. But what you have is that you know Sony probably didn't want to invest a lot in making a very precise system, you know, given that they already had this for electronic viewfinders. So I think what they did is great, but it was probably quick and dirty. So. So here it takes in essentially display port and it has an FPGA that converts it to LVDS to drive the OLED panels, right? So this whole thing could have been eliminated and you could just have a coax going directly to the OLEDs, but it'd be pricier. So that's why I'm arguing this whole box could go away. Then you see the Sony magnifiers on top of the OLED. You won't see this on the videos anywhere online. I guess no one really wanted to mess up their system this much. So if you rip off the uh, aluminum panels on the back, you can see this is a raw OLED panel with thermal paste to help with lifetime. You keep going and you can rip off the optics. You can get the Sony uh, QR code and part number. <laughs> so you actually find the part uh, PDF online and get all the specs and uh, driver control and everything. So it's great. And then here's your platform for head mount display research. So anyone in the cigarette community, I encourage them. If they want to try to do a, a do-it-yourself project with head mounts, this is a great way to go. I mean, keep in mind you get a pair of 0.7 inch diagonal 720p TVs plus the driver circuitry to run it. So if you go to an external company, 
this is tens of thousands of dollars to have custom made or, or even just off the shelf. So it's, it's a beautiful system. And it is very well engineered. So then one nuance here is this is treated as a 3D TV. So you have to provide it an HDMI 1.4A signal to actually get the full resolution of both panels. And so to do that, being in NVIDIA, we have a product called 3D TV Play, which will actually allow you to generate a stereo pair, and then a quad buffer in OpenGL will actually correctly create the HDMI 1.4A stream. So that's uh, fortuitous. And then you can have the fun that everyone likes to do nowadays, which is go find a 3D printer and, to the best of your ability, make a cool head mount. You can tell I'm not particularly skilled at that, so it's a box with some uh, holes in the bottom for the glasses. And then the last little bit is you have to mount the micro lens array very precisely from the micro uh, display. Right? So to do that, we used a stereolithography printer and sand it very carefully until it was the exact optical <laughs> separation, sandwich it, and tension it like a drum head. And it's, man, surprisingly, I didn't think it would, has held up through SIGGRAPH and a couple months afterwards of being dropped. So uh, that still surprises me. You mentioned the display had to be off slightly or something. Is that there? Yeah, it, the lens can get slightly shifted. And so far, I haven't had to recalibrate. Although, yeah, see, at the demo I did last week, it was a little off. But again, yeah. So that's the, the whole setup. And then this is what you get in the end. And I think that's essentially where I'll leave it. That's the, the project in a nutshell. Uh, plenty of questions, I'm sure. Fire away. I'm curious, you mentioned that uh, there's some reason that you want to tilt the lens light uh, grid. Is, is that correct? Why would we some reason to tilt the lens light grid. You mentioned something about tilting the lens. <coughs> I didn't know what you really meant, but I was curious about that. Tilting the lens. Uh, so you definitely want to have the micro display and the lens array equal right? So you don't want any shift. If you did, it would be like a tilt shift camera lens. Yeah. And it would actually create a tilt shift plane in the world. I thought you meant the, the actual grid of lenses. Yes. Tilted oh, sorry. So 3D TVs, right? What they do is they, they don't have a 2D lens array. They have cylindrical lenses. So it's called a lenticular sheet. And normally what you would do, naively, is imagine you have a, a high resolution panel and you have a cylindrical lens that covers, say, 11 pixels, columns of 11 pixels. And then you have another lens that call, covers another 11 pixels, right? So if you turn on one column of pixels, right, those will only be visible from one direction. And then the next neighboring column will be visible from a slightly different direction. And so basically you, you take across the display, say you have uh, 640 lenses, that gives you a 640 image. And then you render, set, you know, in this case I think I was saying seven, I can't remember, set, uh, 11 or seven or whatever, you render, 11, 64, 640 pixel images and you interlace them across. So the problem with that is you'll lose horizontal resolution by whatever the number of views are. So if you have 10 views, you lose resolution by a factor of 10. <coughs> Horizontally, but vertically, you don't lose anything. Because you're only one view. You're not one view. Yes, the argument why you can do that on a 3D TV is you don't look up and down like this. You only walk left to right on the couch. Right? But you still lose resolution only horizontally. It seems like you would like to be more parsimonious and lose resolution both horizontally and vertically. And Phillips had a brilliant idea that, it's one of those ideas that you're like, why didn't I think of that? Right? So what they do, and what everyone does since then, is they take the lens array and they rotate it slightly. Ever so slightly. Just a fraction of a degree or a few degrees. And what that means is along a scan line, the set of pixels underneath each lens changes by a subpixel, right? So you now actually get more than, you know, if you were had 11 views before, you actually get more views because you have a subpixel shift, right? And in addition, you, depending on the angle, you essentially lose resolution by the square root of the number of views in each direction. So in my system, I actually need vertical parallax and horizontal parallax, so I have to have a 2D lens array. So there's no reason to rotate the lens, per se. But you do need to rotate it correctly. And so if I go back here for a second, I skipped this video. But here you can see basically the thing that's going around, taken apart, and you keep the film stationary when you rotate the lens. Right? So with a, without changing how you render, right, if you assume a priori that you have a perfectly oriented lens grid, 
right? Then if you have a you know misshapen or oriented rotated lens, you get all these Moyet artifacts. It's, you know, there's, there's a nice theory behind it. Uh, there's a paper from maybe two decades ago called the Moyet magnifier, and it explains exactly why you see these patterns with the 2D lens array. It's actually one of my favorite papers. It's very simple, but yes, lens alignment matters a lot. Yeah, were you saying something about that you're shifting the IPD in this display somehow? I am. So, so it, this is another issue for wearables. So this project has taught me a lot about why wearables are so hard. So one reason wearables are so hard is if you want to if you want to handle IPD without any moving parts, it means you need an enormous eye box to support children and adults, right? Essentially, no head mount can, can give you that IPD. I mean, the Rift is probably the closest to it where you know, it doesn't have any cams even to move the lenses. So you'll notice in most head-mounted display devices, there are little knobs where you, or levers where you move the actual eyepieces, right? So in this device, my prototype, I don't have those knobs either, but what I can do is I can actually translate the underlying imagery. I can move, move the viewing zones. And what that does is it translates the eye boxes closer or further away. Yeah, but aren't you gonna get a optical shift that's gonna cause a, a slight convergence issue? Well, you get an optical shift, but when you render, you're actually including that shift. So you're, you're actually countering the render effect in the, the render buffer. Actually. Yeah, so, you, so, so without moving the optics at all, all we're doing is translating the underlying image. So for instance, here, I'm showing what happens in this movie. As you take a camera and you just translate it, and you see, you see what's happening very clearly on my laptop, you're basically seeing the periodic repetition of the viewing zones. So if your eye was fixed, we need to move the viewing zone to you. And so the way you would do that is rather than moving your head or your eyes, because you can't move your eyes closer together, you can translate the image you render. So we're translating the camera or the image. Yeah. You'd actually want to translate the cameras and the images uh, to do this correctly. And so let's see if I have a video of that. I think I have one here, if I recall. So you're here. Just by a subtle shift, this is what the camera fixed. We're sliding the eye box, and of course you can do that in tandem and move the. But you are changing the sweet spot. So what you really want to do is probably still allow the device to adjust IPD on cams and then have this. Uh, so that's an issue for stereo wearables, and it's now that I'm aware of it. You know, whenever we get stereo Google Glass, I'm curious to see how a well-engineered solution can handle this problem with a fairly tight eye box. It's just a fundamental problem for head mounts. It's one great reason to only do a monocular. Having done this project, project, I have a huge respect for all the choices made for glass, because it rides right up to what can be done well with current optics, right? Don't do two, don't do stereo, do one. Do a narrow field of view, put it away, right? It, it really makes a lot of sense, and I can sort of sympathize with why engineers chose all that. Any other questions? Yeah. So um, you said two letters several times during your talk, but I don't really see it in the device, which is the letters are A R. And I'm wondering ah. if uh, there's a future extension you intend, or what? Certainly, yes. I'm not. We're not presenting anything, but it certainly begs the question. Light fields had a lot of benefits for V R, and the reason I chose, I actually started this project hoping to do A R, mm -hmm. but I, I bet on micro lenses because having worked on 3D TVs, there are lots of crazy ways of getting a light field. And I spend a lot of time in cigarette papers trying to convince people there are crazy ways to do it. But at the end of the day, lenses are always the best. Brute force. And so that's why I chose a micro lens. But the problem is, if it's still going around, if you look at the world through a micro lens, you're looking through a diffuser. And you can add optical elements to cancel it, but then you limit field of view, all sorts of things. So yes, I definitely think this has merit for AR. I don't have a bulletproof prototype I can show you yet, but certainly something I can ask. I couldn't ask you about is it a prism like this guy or what? Not yet. <laughs> We're not ready to present anything yet. And you know, there are certainly lots of ways you can consider doing it. But the question is what is really viable without getting exotic. Does it still work if you curve the screen? Yeah, ideally, if you gave me a curved screen, I'd curve the micro lenses. And if you see the prototype, that eventually will come back, hopefully. You'll notice it's a 70 degree field of view and as you look to the periphery, you can start to sort of resolve the lens structure. You can start to sort of tell that there are lenses. And that's because 
When it's right in front of you, it's maybe two and a half centimeters or two centimeters from your eye. Obviously, at the cosine of that angle, you're starting to get enough distance where the optical blur is on the order of a millimeter and you're starting to see the lenses. One way to get around that would be to curve the lens array so that it stays roughly equidistant from the face, but then you need to curve the micro display. And right now, it's sort of hard to source a curved OLED, although certainly Samsung is rumored for a long time to be releasing curved uh, OLED panels. So it's, it's yeah. Is it play with uh, projector arrays to also get high resolution and curved surfaces? I pitched my, my boss on that, and we decided to, to not go that route. Uh, yeah. yeah, exactly. So yes, you definitely can jump ahead of Moore's Law and technology and simulate a curved display with a diffuser and a bunch of Pico projectors, but then you can't wear the thing. Or you shouldn't, it would be really heavy. Yeah. Uh, website has a, a one inch diagonal 1280 by 1024 LCD, and they also have a like, like the head mount display using two of those. Yep. It's been there for years, I didn't see much. Is it real? I haven't seen it. So, yeah, so for those who don't know, Copen is one of the small, one of several small, small suppliers that when you dive into the world of micro displays, you know, I want an HD display that's an inch diagonal. If you're talking about LCDs, the one you'll find very quickly is Copen, who, you know, actually is in consumer products. I think, I'm not sure, but I think they supply the Musics line of products, is, is my, what I've heard, so the, 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 the yeah, they do. Has consumer and military. Yeah, and military. Of course, military funds all of this, but, so, so I've never seen their highest end. So, so assuming Copen displays are in Vuzix, I've seen a lot of the Vuzix products, and none of them are that high res. So, I'm, but making a one-inch diagonal LCD that is HD resolution shouldn't be you know, that exotic, because L cost can go easily that. that right, far. but it should make it possible for the business a wide-angle, wide-wide field of view, just using simple. Yeah, that would certainly be the, the choice. The nice thing about OLEDs, of course, and the why, why you'd want an OLED for any head mount is you don't need to integrate the backlight in addition to the modulator. So it would be slightly thicker. Big deal, Big deal yeah. So, so I looked into the, the, also just for you know, your own sanity, Copen, to my knowledge, doesn't give you a nice you know, developer kit that has even a driver board this small, right? Most micro displays you'll find, like the LCD ones, you can get Another source is Hololine that provides them as spatial light modulators for optical sciences, right? So if you're in a physics lab and you have an optics bench and you want an LCD modulating something, this company Hololine will sell you, you know, fairly high resolution LCD transmission panels, but they're also attached to a box, a shoe box, right? So you have to hit the sweet spot that if it's just one or, one or two guys working on a project, you don't want to be tethered to a shoe box for a wearable. So that sort of took that off the list of contenders and really made the Sony attractive, right? Almost no dev kit for an OLED is this small, because there's no reason for it, it's a, it's a dev kit. So how about the, uh, the third generation Sony just announced a few weeks ago? The HMZT3W? Yeah. Uh, I, don't, I don't know much about it. I know, my understanding is that the HMZT2, which you can only get as an import in the US, I thought it used the same panel, although I don't know. Uh, and my <coughs> assumption was that the HMZ T3 also uses the same panel, but I don't, I, I'm actually curious. If it used a better panel, it would be a great, I, I imagine the fundamentals of the device haven't changed dramatically, so it would it'd be great to take apart and take a look at. Uh, Sony makes wonderful OLEDs, so. Yeah. So have you studied any motion artifacting and what's your resolution at the motion artifacting level? Motion artifact, so there are a couple motion artifacts in head mounts. So for instance, in my prototype, I have no head tracking. Well, no, I'm talking about as your motion artifacting from the image moving in the display through the micro array. Like aliasing effect. Yeah, micro aliasing is one. As, the mo as something moves through your display, because yes. you're using a micro array, yeah. what is the aliasing amount that you would see it across? You're talking about like a being and moving and is it like a spatial so, so at a high level, what we did is we implemented light field anti-aliasing. Okay. So we actually, when we render the light field, we filter it. To eliminate both spatial and angular aliasing artifacts. So, uh, Matthias Sawicker, who was a postdoc at MIT and now uh, is at, uh, in Germany as a professor, he had a series of papers six, seven years ago that I keep citing because it was great work 
And I think one of the titles is roughly light field anti-aliasing. So we anti-alias the content, first of all, so that you can't perceive those artifacts. But then you still get motion artifacts because you have an OLED which is driven not as a passive matrix, but as an active matrix. And so you get the sort of zero order hold motion blur that you get with all hold type displays. Right, so that that's there. But you're taking care of the micro lensing effect by doing the anti-aliasing anti through the yeah. light field. Okay. So if you didn't, and if you get a chance, I know it's already getting late, but if you get a chance to try the prototype, I can toggle the anti-aliasing on and off. And you can see some, for the most part, it looks like classic aliasing. If you look at a stairwell, so I have Doom 3 running on this, I didn't have time to show that, but if you look at a stairwell in Doom 3, you turn aliasing off, you see the classic, you know, way patterns across the stairwell. And yes, there's some angular component, but this is sort of the dual of a light field, so it's not, the angular aliasing artifacts are not as dramatic as the spatial ones. So it ends up being very similar to traditional super sampling. Yeah, you can, you can show it as a zebra, then you will immediately see the effect. Yeah, actually I have a zebra in one of the demos. Oh, really? But the spatial frequency of that grading is not high enough to see it, yeah. Good time to do it here. Let's yeah. thank our speakers. I also want to thank Paul at Google here and Google for hosting the event here and Alesh for. Alesh for arranging all the details <laughs> together here. He's our vice chair. Thanks again. Please clean up after your